The Bible has this amazing ability to see deep inside of us, to see how we function, right? The Hebrews 4 talks about how the Word of God is living and active and sharper than a two-edged sword, and it can cut to the very, the very thoughts and intentions of the heart. And this is a song that reminds us of that. It shows us how God can see into our hearts, especially into our wickedness, and can see exactly what motivates us. And so it's very instructive, very helpful for us. So this is an interesting psalm, Psalm 10. The first 11 verses are so depressing, but it ends on this amazing note of confidence and of joy in the face of hardship. So if you're facing external oppression or hardship right now, this psalm is going to be so encouraging for you. So I'm excited to dig into this. So last week we mentioned that um, some argue that Psalms 9 and 10 are actually supposed to be one unified psalm, and they argue it on the basis of there's some indications that it's a Hebrew acrostic poem, meaning that um, each verse has a different letter of the Hebrew alphabet, and they go in order. The problem is it doesn't seem like that actually continues through Psalm 10, so it's kind of uh, inexact, and it probably is not the case. But, um, But that being said, right, if there's an acrostic here, it's super messy if it's present at all. And even the tone is very different. Psalm 9 is, uh, is you know, much more confident, and Psalm 10 seems so despairing and discouraging, at least for the beginning. So I don't think these are the same, but this, this, they're, they're very related. Clearly, they're very closely related, and they have some of the same themes. So let's dig into Psalm 10. And in Psalm 10, 1, we see the opening question, the opening question. So the psalmist says, Why, O Lord, do you stand far away? Why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? So this opening question frames the entire psalm. This question gets to the, the, the core issue for David, which is that God seems distant from him. He, he feels isolated from God. And so how do you act when you feel like God is distant from you? And this is due, it seems like, to the evil that is pervading the world. And God is not acting as David thinks God should act. And so he seems discouraged, right? So the idea here is, why is God not active in the world? in a way to intervene for his people and to save. And I'm sure many of us feel this way at different times. We wonder why is God not acting as we think he should act? So that's the opening question. And then we see an extended discussion of how the wicked thinks. So, so verses 2 to 13 are all about how the wicked thinks. And this section is really two sets of, of about five verses, right? Each ending with a quote of this internal dialogue from a wicked person. So there's sort of two two different sets, I guess. It's like five and seven verses with these quotes of what the wicked person thinks. And so these quotes are very instructive. They give us this inside look into an evil person's mind and even into our minds, even if we're saved by grace and we're transformed by Jesus, at times we will think like the wicked because we still have the flesh. And so this kind of inside look into evil is very helpful for us. So look at verses 2 through 3. It says, In arrogance the wicked hotly pursue the poor. Let them be caught in the schemes that they have devised, for the wicked boasts of the desires of his soul. And the one greedy for gain curses and renounces the Lord. So the wicked person is arrogant um, in what he desires. He's boasting of what he desires in this passage. And this language is really the language of worship. His confidence is in pursuing what he wants. That's where his confidence lies. That's where his religion lies. He's guided by his desires above everything else. And the end of verse 3, when it says, the one greedy for gain curses the Lord, that could be translated, he blesses the one greedy for gain. It's an interesting phrasing. So what it seems to be saying is that Evil people love it when others do evil. Evil people love it when there's a community of evil around them, when they feel supported in what they do. And one of the greatest threats to someone doing evil is someone doing a righteous deed. It reminds me of 1 Peter 4.4, 4, when Peter's talking about wicked people, and he says, with respect to this, they are surprised when you do not join them in the same flood of debauchery, and they malign you. So when a evil person is dealing with a righteous person, they get upset sometimes and they attack that righteous person because they're not joining in the same kind of evil. Evil wants company. 
And so David is praying that these kinds of people, their schemes would be turned around on them, that they would be thwarted, that they would be frustrated um, because of their wicked schemes. In verse 4, uh, he says, In the pride of his face, the wicked does not seek him. All his thoughts are, there is no God. So this phrase, in the pride of his face, it's a weird phrase for us. What it literally means in Greek, the literal translation would be, according to the height of his nose, which sounds really strange to us, right? But you can understand, he's talking about someone's nose being lifted up, right? It's the, you know, the highest part on their body, so to speak. So this is the same picture we have today of someone turning their nose up at someone else, someone being arrogant and haughty. And so he's saying here that they are way too proud to ask for God's help. Um, in fact, this person, the wicked person, thinks that he is supreme. He doesn't believe that God is supreme. He thinks that he is the most important person in the world. So we see here uh, that the first thing that the wicked person thinks in verse 4, the first thing the wicked person thinks is that God doesn't exist. God doesn't exist. Now, this is, this is his functional theology. He believes in his heart of hearts that God doesn't exist. We're going to see the same language when we get to Psalm 14, which is probably the most famous phrase in this regard, <clears throat> where he says, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. So we're going to see that in a couple of weeks. But this is the common thing for the wicked or the foolish person is to say, functionally, they don't believe that God exists, right? There are atheists who openly claim this, but this is probably someone who would outwardly claim to believe in God, but not live in concert with that belief, not live in a way that reflects that God actually exists. So the first thing we see about the wicked is that they live in the belief that God does not exist. And that's going to shape all of your morality. If you believe that, if you believe God doesn't exist, why would you not act corruptly? Why would you not do evil things? Look at verse 5. His ways prosper at all times. Your judgments are on high out of his sight. As for all his foes, he puffs at them. He says in his heart, I shall not be moved. Throughout all generations, I shall not meet adversity. So it seems here like the wicked person is actually being blessed. This would seem to go against Psalm 1 and Psalm 2, which said so clearly that it's those who take refuge in Yahweh and who walk the path of righteousness that are blessed. So here, why is it that the wicked are being blessed? There's this, at least for a season, they're benefiting from their wickedness, and this doesn't seem to be right. And, and they feel secure because of this. And so the language here in verse 6, we see the second thing that the wicked believes, the second uh, indication of the thoughts of the wicked's wicked the first the first there's actually two beliefs in this so the first thing is i won't be moved so he's claiming security for himself he's saying i'm not going to be hurt by anything and then he says i won't have problems essentially right he's, he also believes that he'll be whole and he'll be satisfied because of his evil so he believes no one's going to hurt him and that life is going to be good he's so confident in the future because of his current situation and it's interesting this is actually the exact opposite way that the righteous person should think. The righteous person is always saying, I don't know what the future brings, at least in, in this life, and so I trust in God for it. It's the opposite of James chapter 4. Right, James 4.13 says, Come now you who say, Today or tomorrow we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make profit, yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. So the righteous person is always thinking, I don't know what the future brings. So I'm going to live in, in a righteous way. I'm going to trust God, but he's the one who has to secure my future. But here, this wicked person believes that they know what the future is like. They're so confident in their own wickedness. It reminds me also of the words of C.S. Lewis in the Screw Tape Letters, where he's, you know, his words in that book are the words of a, a tempter, of a demon, right? But he's speaking about how can you get somebody to go to hell? And the, one of the famous quotes from that book is when he says this, Indeed, the safest road to hell is the gradual one, the gentle slope, soft underfoot, without sudden turnings, without milestones, without signposts. Now, the safest way to get someone to hell for a demon is to make them confident in their future, to allow them to have an easy path through life, to feel comfortable, to feel safe until that day when they die and they go straight to hell. So this, this person feels very, very confident. Look at verse 7. It says, His mouth is filled with cursing and deceit 
and oppression. Under his tongue are mischief and iniquity. And then he goes on to talk about how there's this, he's setting this ambush and he's lurking and, and seizing and attacking those who are helpless. So this mention of the mouth and under his tongue, right? It almost sounds like his food <clears throat> is evil speech. Right? Probably the idea is just that his speech is full of these things. It's full of deceit and oppression, of mischief and iniquity, of, of hatred towards those who are weak. He's violent with his speech, and his speech then turns into action in verses 8 and 9. He preys upon the innocent and the vulnerable, and he's, he's pictured here like an animal stalking his prey. And so we see the evil living in this way, looking for those they can hurt and they can oppress. And it's really very dramatic language. If you look at the, the, these verses, there's this repetition of the word lurks, which again is, is very dramatic. And then there's a repetition of the word seizes. So there's, there's clear steps in this that he is looking for ways to harm those who are needy and who are helpless. Verse 10 says, the, the helpless are crushed down, are crushed, sink down and fall by his might. He says in his heart, God has forgotten. He has hidden his face. He will never see it. So we get a third look inside the mind of the wicked here with another quote from the wicked. What the wicked thinks is that God doesn't see what he's doing, and therefore God is not going to act. That's what the wicked person believes. The wicked, so the wicked believe, to, to recap all of these things we've seen, that God doesn't exist, that God doesn't have authority or control over the world, they believe that they are secure and whole in their sin, and they believe that God will not judge them in their sin. In a lot of ways, it reminds me of the words of Satan, the first words of Satan in the Bible from Genesis chapter 3, when the serpent appears and tempts Adam and Eve. It's the same kind of temptation, right? In Genesis 3, 1, the serpent says to the woman, did God actually say, you shall not eat from any tree in the garden? Did God actually say the first question that's asked from this from the serpent, it's not a direct accusation, but embedded in it is this temptation to doubt God's word. All temptation starts with believing that God doesn't have authority, that his word doesn't really matter. And then the first lie is told in Genesis 3, 4, when the serpent says, you will not surely die. And that's the lie of every sin that we've ever committed. We believe in our hearts that there will be no judgment, no penalty because of this sin. Same as the wicked believe in this passage. And then, of course, in Genesis 3, 5, he goes on to say, For God knows that when you eat of it, you, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So, this, so the sin starts with doubting God's word. Then it goes to denying God's judgment. And then it goes to saying you can replace God. You can be God in your own life. You can be like him, which of course was a terrible lie because Adam and Eve were already created in God's likeness. They were like God in the ways they should be like God, but they sought to seize more control and more authority in their life than they should have. So the, the way the wicked thinks is the same way that Satan has always thought, and this is the, the sure path to destruction, believing that God does not act, that he does not care. In fact, in verse 13, he repeats the same idea, <clears throat> saying that the wicked says in his heart, you will not call to account. In other words, God's not going to judge. He's not going to avenge our wickedness because of our crimes. That's how wicked people think, and that's how they, the wicked people act as a result. So we, we've seen in detail how the wicked think, but now we got to see how God responds. So verses 14 to 18 show us how God responds. Because, of course, the wicked live in a delusion. There is a God, and he will respond to all the wicked deeds of men, and he will bring every thought and every action to account. The Bible clearly tells us that. Look at verse 14. But you do see, for you note mischief and vexation, that you may take it into your hands. To you the helpless commits himself. You have been the helper of the fatherless. So what's the answer when we're dealing with insurmountable evil? Well, it's to remember who God is because that doesn't change. No matter what is going on in our lives, no matter the circumstances that are changing, how everything seems to be falling apart, God doesn't change. He remains firm. So we have to look to the rock that we can depend on. 
For the helpless person, there is a place where you can find help. It's in God. To the fatherless person, there's a place you can find a father. And that's God himself, right? If you're without a father, especially in this ancient culture, but even it's true today, if you don't have a father, then you're missing a key protector in your life. Fathers are designed, they're made to protect their children. And so without that, there's a possibility of so many evil things happening to a person. But God especially cares for the fatherless. Like this is the first time in the Psalms that we see that word fatherless, which we're going to see again. God cares about the orphans. He cares about those who have been mistreated and abandoned by those who were supposed to care for them. And, and he says he commits himself to God. It literally, that phrase literally means abandoning yourself. But the, the person who trusts in God, they abandon themselves. They fully trust in God with their entire being. And these people trust in God probably because they have no one else to trust in. But the same is true for us. It doesn't matter if you have everything in your life that you could possibly need. If you're strong, healthy, wealthy, whatever it might be, you need God and you need to abandon yourself, commit yourself fully to God. He's the only one who can sustain you. Verse 15, he calls on him to break the arm of the wicked and the evildoer. Call his wickedness to account so you find none. So he's breaking the arm is the idea of destroying their power. The arm is the power of the wicked. He's calling God to destroy them, to cripple them so that they can't act in this way. And so the psalm ends with this powerful declaration of who God is, of his character and his strength. It ends with confidence in God. And I love this. These are some great verses that you could memorize and meditate on. Verses 16 to 18. The Lord is king forever and ever. The nations perish from his land. O Lord, you who hear the desire of the afflicted, you will strengthen their heart. You will incline your ear to do justice to the fatherless and the oppressed, so that man who is of the earth may strike terror no more. Amazing ending, right? We see the confidence restored that God is king and he will use his authority to defend his people, to bring justice to the oppressed, and to destroy the power of evildoers. He will eradicate evil from this earth one day. We can have confidence in that. And so the psalmist at the end here reminds us of exactly who God is. So what are some practical thoughts we can, we can take from this? Well, one thing that I noticed as I was reading this and, and thinking on this and studying it was how amazing it is that the words of the psalmist seem to apply directly to our year today, right? 2023, I, I see a lot of parallels here in terms of how people abuse and mistreat others, right? The need for um, something confident, something we can can really stand on in the midst of a culture that's gone crazy. And we'll see more of that in the next Psalm as well. But this, this applies so well to today. And here I think we should just take away and think on some warnings to the wicked and some encouragements to the weak. So some warnings to the wicked. What we see in this passage is that wickedness is complete foolishness. It's denying the most obvious truths in the world, truths like God is real. If you deny that truth, then you're going to live in foolishness, right? Sin, every time we sin, we are functionally atheists. Whether we say we believe in God or not, whether we go to church and do all those things, when we sin, we are demonstrating that at some way in our heart, we don't truly believe that God is real. Because if we did, we would fear him. We would take that seriously. Every sin is denying God's word and it's denying God's judgment. And so when we sin, we act like atheists. So wickedness acts like God isn't real. It denies the truth that God will punish the wicked, that sin has natural consequences and it has eternal consequences as well. These truths are evident to our world and yet we so often deny them. You know, I quoted this this quote from Tim Keller when when we were in Psalm chapter 2. Um, But it's worth saying again, Tim Keller says, sin is a suicidal action of the will upon itself. Sin is foolishness. It is suicidal. It is destructive. If we could only see where our sin was leading, we would act differently. We We would be warned. We would be terrified to sin against God. And so it's a great reminder here to to those who are wicked of of what sin is, of how serious it is, that every sin, its intention is to destroy and dethrone God and to make yourself the king. And that only leads to disintegration in your life and to ultimate destruction. So we have warnings to the wicked. We also have encouragements to the weak. 
There's encouragement here if, if you are suffering from oppression, right? One thing is we should just be thankful. I'm sure most of the people that are going to watch this video are you know, in America or in a Western culture that is very protected. And even though we're seeing culture go in very bad directions and oppression is sure to increase, not decrease, we should still be thankful that we don't suffer from much oppression. Uh, in America, we're incredibly blessed to still be able to practice our faith, to still be able to be open about all these truths, right? Without much fear that there's going to be something that, negative that will happen to us. So we should be thankful about relatively in history how little oppression we face. Um, there are many times, though, when the wicked prosper in this life, and we're going to wonder why. Why are those who are being oppressive and doing these evil things, why are they prospering? But don't forget that God blesses us through times of suffering that God is so in control, he's using every circumstance in our life to bring us greater blessing, to draw us closer to him, to show us his love, to take our dependence off of the things of this world or our own strength and to put it on him. The Bible is constantly speaking of how weakness and suffering can lead us closer to God. So suffering is part of his plan. So don't get discouraged. See the big picture. See what God is doing. Strive to see that as you look at scripture and see um, what he says about the future. Also remember the prosperity of the wicked is very short. A wicked person might prosper for a couple years or even a couple decades in this life, but that's the best they're going to get. The end for the wicked is one of destruction. The prosperity of the wicked is short and the joy and, and the prosperity of the righteous will endure forever. So take, take, uh, take encouragement from that. Be encouraged that you know that your prosperity, when it comes, it will not fade away, that God's going to hold you secure forever. Um, and there's great comfort, again, as we've seen in previous Psalms, there's great comfort in this truth that vengeance belongs to the Lord, that he's going to sort out everything in this life. And so we can focus on what he's given us to do day by day, and we can leave the details up to him. Wickedness will one day be destroyed forever, and those who practice it will be wiped off the face of the earth. So continue to do righteousness. Continue to seek after him. Continue to grow in your faith and your trust and your love for God. Thanks so much for watching this video. We're uploading great biblical content every single week. So make sure you subscribe, like this video, and leave a comment down below. We'd love to discuss with you. If you want to support us financially, there's a link in the description of this video. Thanks so much.